Uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Hamid Akbia, University Professor and Director of the Autonomous Systems Policy Institute at Syracuse University. Uh, I also have the honor of serving as the founding director of the Academic Alliance for AI Policy, a group of around 50 universities that we launched exactly a year ago in Washington, D.C. As outlined in our charter, our goal is to provide evidence-based information and insights to the public, media, and policymakers about the emerging social and policy issues that arise with the widespread adoption of generative AI in our societies. In celebration of our anniversary, it is my great pleasure to open the first in a series of webinars on these topics. The topic of this webinar is misinformation and deepfakes, which as you know, is a timely topic in light of the upcoming election in the US and the unfortunate spread of misinformation by domestic and international players. We intend to continue these series on other important topics, and we welcome any feedback and suggestions about the content and format of the webinars. You can share your views by email or through our website at www.aaipolicy.org, aaipolicy.org. Please feel free to share any feedback uh, you know, about the future and this seminar as well. Uh, this event is made possible by the efforts of many individuals, including my colleagues, Linnell Cavazas and Joseph Reed. I'd like to thank the members of the Alliance, especially our steering committee for active involvement. I'd also like to thank Professor Lee Rainey from Elon University for his support, Professor Daniel Schiff of Purdue University for coordinating this panel, and our panelists, Letitia Boat, Thomas Costello, and Valerie Wirtschafter. With that, I pass the floor to Daniel, who will introduce the panelists. Thank you. Well, wonderful. Thanks for uh, introducing us, Hamid. Also really excited to be here for the inaugural webinar of the Triple AIP. Glad to have such a robust audience and to have uh, three really amazing panelists. Looks like we're just trying to get Tom into presenter status so he can join us on, on video. Um, so I'm uh, Daniel Schiff, as Hamid said. I'm an assistant professor of technology policy at Purdue. I study AI policy and ethics. Some of that work um, is on deepfakes through our lab, which is the Governance and Responsible AI Lab, or GRAIL. I um, also wanted to thank Hamid, Linnell, Lee, uh, Joseph, uh, and our, our three wonderful panelists. The goal of, of our discussion today is to provide something along the lines of high quality, rigorous, nonpartisan evidence that can inform policy making that can inform governance by companies and platforms, companies working on media literacy or deepfake detection or any other strategies that we want to pursue to, to build our information environment in a, in a positive direction. Um, so we're going to try to give a little bit of a state of the union, if you will, of what we really know about misinformation and disinformation and deepfakes, what we don't know yet, uh, what we're you know still exploring. Uh, and to do this, we've uh, identified three uh, phenomenal uh, researchers and thought leaders uh, in this space who will help uh, kind of walk us through the story. We'll uh, proceed with the panel for about 40, 45 minutes and then open up to Q&A for the last uh, portion of the discussion. Okay. Um, so let me start with uh, uh, Letitia. So uh, Dr. Letitia Bodhi, I think that's, am I pronouncing that right, Letitia? Yes, okay. Uh, so uh, Letitia is a professor in uh, the Communication, Culture, and Technology Master's Program at Georgetown and is the inaugural research director of the Knight Georgetown Institute, which connects independent research with technology policy and design. So a really exciting institute. Look forward to hearing about that. Uh, her PhD is in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, her bachelor's from Trinity University, and her work lies at the intersection of communication, technology, and political behavior emphasizing the role communication and information technologies play in acquisition and use of political information and misinformation. Letitia has many, many dozens of articles and a book expected uh, next year. Uh, so welcome, Letitia. Okay, um, do we have Tom? So Tom's here, but we don't have him on. Oh, we have, we have you on video. Hey, now, yeah, Wonderful. I'm here. I'm, okay. Glad to have but... you. Okay. Uh, so, uh, Dr. Thomas Castell, and you prefer Tom? 
Mm-hmm. Or Thomas. You know, I, I, either one is fine. I, I usually go by Tom among friends, so let's let's say Tom. Okay, well, we'll do Tom. Uh, Tom's an assistant professor of psychology at American University. He studies where political and social beliefs come from, uh, how they differ from person to person, and how they change and why they change uh, using AI and tools from personality, cognitive, clinical uh, psychology, and political science. Uh, he did his doctoral training in clinical psychology at Emory. So we were just uh, maybe a few blocks down the road, Tom, uh, crossing paths then, and just finished up his postdoctoral fellowship at MIT, where he's published also dozens of papers in uh, top outlets uh, with a lot of impact on uh, media, on uh, social media platforms, uh, and hopefully on policy. Uh, so glad to have you and your perspective. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Thanks. All right, and then our last panelist, uh, also from DC, so we've got three panels from DC, uh, Dr. Valerie Wirtschachter uh, is a fellow in foreign policy and the artificial intelligence and emerging technology initiative at the, the Brookings Institute. Uh, her research falls into two main thematic areas. Uh, one is democratic resilience and democratic erosion. And second, artificial intelligence, technology, and the information space. Uh, using uh, a data-driven approach, uh, Valerie's work uh, helps reframe discussions around underexplored media, novel challenges in the information space, and provides new tools and methods in academic and policy research, which has reshaped practices at leading technology companies, and I also believe in, in policy circles. Um, Valerie's a PhD is in political science from University of California, Los Angeles. Um, so uh, welcome to uh, all three of you. Um, I don't know if you all have met before. Next time we'll do this in uh, DC in person. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, I just I moved to DC about two months ago, so I haven't. We, I have not met almost anyone here yet. So, but hopefully we can we can cross paths. Wonderful. I, I look look forward to it. We'll do a, a AAA IP meetup or something mm-hmm. along those lines. Okay. So I want to start uh, talking about just some of the background trends and causes of kind of where we are now to help get the audience sort of up to speed. Uh, and for people who will be watching this recording in the future. Uh, and I'll start with you, Letitia. Um, could you sort of clue us in? Uh, what are the trends that we're generally observing in the evolution of misinformation over the past few years, and particularly for some of the contexts that are very high stakes, like political communication or, say, health-related misinformation? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so thanks for the kind introduction, and, and so thrilled to be on this panel with uh, my fellow panelists. Um, and we should definitely all get a drink sometime, clearly. Um, so uh, trends. I tell people that this election is, and I'm going to focus on the election because I can't not focus on the election right now. And I hope that that's OK with everyone, despite the pre-election anxiety that I'm sure we're all feeling. Um, uh, so yeah, thinking about electoral misinformation, in some ways, this is an election that is very uh, like any other. So electoral misinformation in particular is very predictable in terms of the themes that it takes on. Um, I love to tell people about this uh, collaboration of a bunch of different Latin American fact checkers from a few years ago. They all came together and compared and contrasted all the misinformation they were seeing in their different countries related to elections. So we're talking about multiple elections over like 10 years, dozens of candidates, totally different cultural contexts, and they basically found there are 10 different types of misinformation related to elections, right? very predictable. Um, and it's all the things that you would think it is, right? So it's like, who is allowed to vote? How are you allowed to vote? What invalidates a ballot? How do ballots have to be collected? All of those kinds of things related to the process itself and to election day, as well as you know early voting and absentee ballot um, as well. Um, so from that perspective, it's super predictable. And we're seeing all of those kinds of themes in this election as we've seen before and as we see in other countries as well. Um, it's worth remembering U.S. is just a drop in the bucket of the 2024 elections uh, space where half of the world's population is electing their uh, leader of their nation um, this year. So most of them have already happened. Um, but I do think that there's a trend that does make this election season different. Um, And it is a trend, it's not just this election, but I think it's been amplified this year, which is that we've seen greater elite endorsement of misinformation um, over time, over the past few years, uh, the past few election cycles. And I think that is only amplified um, this year to the point that you have, you know, literally hundreds of nationally elected 
office holders that are refusing to take a stance on who won the last election, um, which is kind of uh, astounding. And I think uh, just worth noting that that is very different than what we've seen in the past. Uh, we, we observed something similar in our, our political deepfakes incidents database of more sharing by campaigns and public figures as opposed to just sort of random Twitter users or, or adversarial actors. Uh, very helpful. Thank you. Thanks so much for that. Um, Valerie, maybe you can sort of take us to kind of the extension of this space um, to the, the landscape of foreign influence operations. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, um, and connect us to like how this has evolved, especially <laughs> with AI sort of kicking off. Yeah. So, you know, it has been extremely active on the foreign side. I don't have the numbers in front of me, um, but my understanding was in 2020, there was one public disclosure from the intelligence community and uh, the FBI and DOJ and these groups that are sort of monitoring this space from various angles. We've already seen four or five, um, including one that came out really quickly, I think the fastest attribution ever to Russia um, of uh, ballots being ripped up in um, Bucks County, Pennsylvania, um, attributed directly to Russia with a high degree of confidence, noticeably not a deep fake, not AI generated. Some of this has been manipulated media. Um, so, you know, it's become, I think, a, a really fraught space because a lot of these foreign actors, and I should say it cuts across the political spectrum as well, so it's not just Russia, which clearly has a preference for one candidate, which is shaped by um, objectives in Ukraine, uh, but also Iran has a preferred candidate, um, as seen from the hacking of the Trump campaigns and efforts to foment discord around the Israel-Hamas um, conflict. And so, you know, this has been a really active space from all sides of the political spectrum. Um, all, several of these indictments, as well as a couple of reports from um, leading AI developers, have highlighted the ways that AI has been used. Uh, you know, some of that is helping to populate these sort of cyber-squatted domains. So Russia created domains that were like WashingtonPost.i or something like that, like fake looking versions of real domains that then mimicked what the what the outlets actually look like, um, you know, so that that has been kind of a content generation process. Um, but the impact, you know, and we've seen a little bit of this from the open AI reports that they've been putting out regularly, and I highly recommend looking at those because they do provide quite a bit of examples, of just how people have been trying to use these tools, foreign actors, um, you know, they definitely have, but it's still been quite sloppy. Um, so there was a report from, I think it was July, um, that, you know, basically copied and pasted from um, ChatGPT to a WhatsApp group or maybe a Telegram channel. Um, I cannot assume the identity of a 47-year-old Jewish man from Rochester, New York, or something like that, that was just kind of pulled and <laughs> pulled in from the, the LLM into the chat without any sort of verification. Or certainly, I can separate these terms into different tags and then the different tags that then populated a blog post. So it's still been a bit sloppy. And these are, of course, different examples. Um, but broadly, you know, they highlight two different areas where AI has been used as kind of an accelerator. Um, and an effort to improve some of these tactics. And so we see it in covert influence operations, um, comments, imagery, et cetera, for social media, the content of these long form articles on these cyber squatted domains, and then cyber operations. So um, things like debugging code um, or, you know, searching for vulnerabilities. There's a great list in the most recent OpenAI report that details some of the, the types of strategies in terms of of cyber operations that actors have tried um it's just a question of effectiveness for now um but you know i think that generally it's tasks that would have required some sort of expertise or taken more time and capacity have become a bit easier um but you know, there is a question, of course, and we see this a little bit more broadly in um, some of the dynamics at play where these actors will actually send their content directly to fact checkers because that is a way to break through more effectively uh, to say, oh, look at this Russian disinformation coming out, fact check this, then it blows up because of the fact checking, not because it somehow found a natural audience online. So I think that it's 
complicated dynamic, AI is certain. A very dynamic space right now and will likely become even more active after the elections. Yeah, I so just one quick follow up on that that last point. A lot of um, the real world impact of information, misinformation, uh, misleading information, right, is contingent on its dissemination. So how many people actually see it? And then so there's the dissemination component and then how much you update based on what you see. And actively false things, like like stuff that is just fictional and made up and might be generated by AI or written by a human. Um, if you can get someone to look at it, it does tend to have, uh, a, like it provokes or promotes a larger updating because it's outlandish and sort of making a wild claim, stronger claim. Uh, but far, far, far fewer people see these kinds of things than they do think, uh, like almost like locally misleading, but true pieces of information. So one example from a recent um, paper for, from uh, our group, though I wasn't involved in it, is that there was like a Chicago Tribune story during COVID that was healthy doctor dies after getting vaccinated. And millions and millions of people saw it and it went viral on Facebook and it was true. The doctor did die, um, but probably not because they were vaccinated. Um, and you can actually look and see how much that changed attitudes and weight it by how many people saw it and compare it to really like actively fake stuff. And f you find that it that one story and stories like it had a, a profound impact relative to misinformation. And, and so I think like, you know, weaving together, like, hey, the, if the elites are starting to adopt this stuff, that's telling, that's important because then people are seeing it. Uh, it's not just a matter of true or false or real or fake. It's it's like level of exposure and, and how it affects the ecosystem. That's very helpful. So, so we have more elite adoption. We have more uh, experimentation by adversarial actors, but imperfect. And then we have this question of who's actually disseminating this? Are they using creative strategies? And who is it actually persuading at the end of the day? Um, maybe I can uh, take uh, this sort of question to you uh, in a little more depth, Tom, um, mm -hmm. which is if, if you could sort of talk us through, given your background, some of the core psychological factors or profiles or processes um, related in this story of engagement with misinformation. And as you said, updating, right, the process of persuasion. Oh, yeah, sure. I I mean, it's it's you can kind of think of it as like, like there's two things that are really important when when you're trying to, to change someone's mind. And, and that's. Uh, like y your credibility in the eyes of the person whose mind you're, you're trying to change and your incentives, whether whether they think that you are incentivized to tell the truth and whether you're competent enough to know what the truth is. Um, and then like that in implicates things like bias. Um, and then also the quality of the information you're providing, like what you're, if what you're saying actually makes any sense. Um, and uh, that doesn't mean it's true or false, but it has to seem true or false. And uh, what we're finding in our work at least is that you can, get pretty far by um, kind of simulating those sorts of qualities with AI in conversation. Um, so AI agents seem like they know what they're talking about. In fact, often they kind of do, even if maybe no is the wrong word, because they're of course not aware or, you know, they're just algorithms. And uh, they can generate text that is full of true information um, and is aping or mimicking a very competent person. And those things together, especially like back and forth in a dynamic where you can ask targeted questions and get facts and the AI will tell you the source, um, can lead to some very persuasive uh, infer interactions and dialogues. And, and what we've done is is um, like test just how persuasive these kinds of interactions are for pro-social outcomes. So like debunking conspiracy theories. And it turns out AI can do a way better job at, at that than um, anything that you could um, do in the moment um, and people have very individual conspiracies so part of the strength of, of the ai is that it's kind of able to customize its responses to exactly what you believe but it's not like it's saying anything that is uh beyond the capabilities of a mediocre lawyer the 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 skill and uh kind of ability or like the strength of the AI approach is that it has memorized the internet so it knows all these weird facts that it can leverage at the right moment so if you gave a bad lawyer the crystallized intelligence of an ai the all of the factual recall uh, it would the lawyer would probably do a far better job than these AI tools can. Um, so there's that, and then the advantage, of course, though, is scale. It's super cheap, virtually free, to generate like a thousand, a million conversations. You know, it's like pennies a conversation. Um, and so as long as you're getting some update, some effect, if you wanted to uh, uh, flood the airwaves with this stuff, um, that would that would probably be an effective strategy. So even if you have, you know, maybe small effects and your strategies aren't always compelling, 
you can do this at, at scale or with customization. Yeah, and I mean, I think, I think the people. problem is, so, so there were some um, political, like in the primary, some, like one political campaign in particular that tried to do like voice to voice uh, canvassing where they would call folks up um, and say, hey, I'm an AI, I want to talk to you about, you know, this, uh, this race. Uh, and the fine, and then, you know, there are companies and startups that are offering this to, to political candidates as a service, and most of them are rejecting it. This one, there was this one instance where it was used, and uh, the finding is that everyone just hung up, hung up as soon as they heard it was an AI. They're like, I'm not doing this. Um, or, or you're kind of mimicking, this is happening, I think, in India, mimicking the, the um, voices and characteristics of the candidates so that you can actually talk one on one with them and get information. So people are trying to um, facilitate uh, democratic processes via like the, these new technologies, which is very strange. Um, and to my knowledge, no one's actually spreading misinformation, but if they were, they wouldn't be telling us about it. So my presumption is this, this stuff is going on, uh, in secret too, uh, right now, probably. And we're going to find out about it later. Um, but there's still this open question of whether it actually will matter and people engage and, and so forth. Uh, very, very helpful. Um, okay. So. We, we know a little bit about how the kind of advances in AI are changing the landscape, what's sort of new here or, or sort of plausibly new here. Um, maybe let me turn this question back to you, uh, Valerie. Uh, so uh, you know, we know that misinformation, disinformation as concepts, they go back centuries, millennia to the, you know, the origin of rhetoric and the origin of politics. Um, could you sort of help walk us through some of the you know, de debates here about you know, is AI something new and different? And these strategies you're seeing are sort of fundamentally different for the reasons that Tom has suggested. Um, uh, you know, is this is this new or is this more of the same old? Yeah, so I, I think it's a, a really important question and something I've thought quite a bit about. Um, you know, for the most part, like as you said, this goes back a long time. One of the the favorite articles that I like to show anybody that I teach, um, whether it's a class that I'm teaching or guest lecturing or whatever, is it's called Fake News in the Media, um, which sounds like it's from 2017, but it's actually like a Harper's article from like 1939 or something like that. Um, so it's really great um, in terms of just kind of, especially even that term feels very modern right now. Um, but, you know, for the most part, um, I think AI generated content is really somewhat of an amplifier of existing trends, existing capabilities. You know, we've had Photoshop for quite some time, um, and that has been able to kind of create these cheap fake versions, right? And so now we're we're getting a bit better at it and the scale is larger, um, but it's not really been necessary so much to, to deploy in order to deceive. And I've looked a little bit at this in terms of just the the amount of sort of contested information and sort of where information is, you know, either viewed as somewhat decontextualized or um, has been kind of fact checked and how much of that is actually AI um, generated or plausibly AI generated. And it's still a very small percentage. So, uh, you know, we've already, we've got a mess on our hands um, without AI. Um, and of course, that adds another layer, certainly. Uh, but I think one of the biggest, um, and you know, you should be the one speaking to this, um, but one of the biggest sort of more unique elements of this AI moment is that uh, sort of the shadow of AI looming um, really allows people to kind of cast doubt on potentially factual information or true content. Um, and you guys had this great article on the liar's dividend, of course. And so, you know, if anything, like anything can be fake if it, if it goes against our prior beliefs or sort of our um, you know, what we find um, credible. And I think that's really new and deep, well, maybe not really new, um, but deeply concerning and sort of extremely accelerated uh, by this AI moment. We saw that with the Harris rally in Detroit. We saw it most recently um, with, I don't even know what was going on, but there was some video, something coming of Donald Trump that was going to be very scandalous and several surrogates took to, to X early and they said, something, a dirty deep fake is going to be coming out of Donald Trump very soon. I still haven't seen it, but the fact that that was what they sort of landed on as the sort of pre-bunking process really shows that like, you know, 
it's so easy now to just dismiss things that we don't like that kind of go against our prior beliefs. Yeah. And so I think that is really, really concerning and very different in this space. Um, yeah, so, so, so it's, a, it's a little bit of, I think, a, a mix there for sure. Did that uh, match your thinking, Tom? Well, I, well, I was just going to quickly say that there's an irony, which is pre-bunking is one intervention tool that was developed to combat the spread of misinformation, you know, uh, telling people to watch out for certain techniques and things. Um, and now, you know, it's a tool, it's double-edged. And so people are leveraging pre-bunking for, uh, uh, hey, it's going to be AI when when there's this damning video or something like that. And so uh, it's perhaps like a dark, dark irony, but it is, it is kind of funny. Very interesting. Okay, so we have yeah. you know, pre-bunking, you know, real content in the way that you would pre-bunk false content. So that this right. sort of dual edge sword that shows up, and, and I think Val, you're pointing to, there's a sort of layer of discourse here. So it's not just what is happening, what actors are doing and how they're innovating, but what we even feel about this, what we think about this, what we trust, um, how confident we are. So that's also sort of shaping uh, yeah, and public AI people's doesn't behavior. Even have even. To, AI doesn't have to be there at all. Like it, it, it just the sort of shadow of AI, the public consciousness of AI, um, you know, it's there even if it doesn't actually show up in a video or an image or audio file. These indirect impacts could be uh, quite important. Well, let me sort of follow up on this thread of, of uh, pre-bunking or debunking and, and turn to you, Letitia, on uh, the fact-checking conversation. So uh, technique that's been allowed, uh, around for a long time also, but sort of resurgence in the last couple of decades to my kind of modest knowledge. Uh, is fact-checking or, or corrections, we call them in this field sometimes, is this effective? Is this effective only for some people or does it sort of backfire sometimes? So what should we sort of know about fact checking and should we be scaling this and so on? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> so um, we have a lot of research on fact checking, probably more than any other misinformation mitigation technique. Um, and it is a very consistent body of research as well. Um, so basically when you give people vast majority of people, and I'll talk about an exception in just a minute, but when you give people new information, they are good about updating their beliefs about that information, um, which suggests that a lot of misinformation is related to an absence of information, or I should say a lot of misperceptions are related to an absence of misinformation as compared to um, kind of willfulness endorsement of misinformation, although there are obviously um, examples of both. Um, in terms of when corrections backfire, we actually have very little evidence to suggest that backfire effects from correction of misinformation are um, at all the norm. Uh, there have been a few like very small uh, backfire effects that have been found over the years, but the vast majority of research uh, finds that people update their beliefs in the face of new information. And that's true even when it's a uh, partisan consistent information, part of, you know, information that helps your party, um, helps your team, you're still willing to update your information when you're uh, presented with the truth most of the time. Now, it may not affect your candidate evaluation. It doesn't change your partisanship, but we wouldn't expect it to, right? Partisanship is more of an identity than it is based on information. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't make sense that we see downstream effects in that regard. The exception that I think is worth mentioning here is conspiracy theorists. So the vast majority of people are not conspiracy theorists. They are not high in conspiracy ideation um, and they're not terribly susceptible to conspiracy theories. Um, but if you are faced with someone who is a conspiracy theorist, information will not help. Um, giving them new information, giving them corrections, giving them fact checks uh, will not change their perceptions because conspiracy theories are like self-sealing, right? They will just build whatever information you give them into that conspiracy. Oh, that must be part of the conspiracy. Somebody told you to tell me that or, you know, whatever. Um, so conspiracy theorists are a totally different um, uh, can of worms, uh, but the vast majority of people are willing to update their uh, information when you give it to them. Okay, so, so generally well, fact-checking well, can be... Oh, oh, go ahead, Tom. Yeah, well, so the only reason I jump in, I'm jumping in here. So we actually, we just had a paper um, in, in science uh, where we um, brought in people who believed conspiracy theories, including folks who, who endorsed a lot of conspiracy theories and had them interact with GPT-4, um, a version of GPT-4 that we call debunk bot that was programmed to um, leverage its 
crystal vast memorization of the internet to deliver like factual rebuttals to conspiracy theories. Um, and the finding is that uh, if you get people to articulate exactly what they believe rather than like a generic kind of amorphous conspiracy, fuzzy conspiracy, and then show them information that pertains directly to their beliefs via the AI conversation, you do get a belief updating effect, even for people who are in like the, you know, the upper echelons of, like, who are like far on the right side of the distribution for conspiracy belief in our sample. Um, and uh, and so I don't know if it's this uh, like categorical difference. I mean, I'm not, the, the, presumably these are not people who are out on the streets wearing tinfoil hats or, or cardboard placards that say the end is near. But I, I think that uh, there's, you know, information does a lot even for conspiracy theorists would be, would be one takeaway from that paper. Okay, so, so some kind of, oh, please. Sorry, just to piggyback, yeah. I think that's super, I, I love that paper, and I think it's super consistent with what we've known for a long time, right, like research from like Hugo Mercier and different people of like, the best way to reach conspiracy theorists is, is to have long conversations with them. And AI gives us the ability to do that in a way that was not possible before. So I think that that part of it is uh, very exciting. As, as was said before, it's a tool and it can be used for good or evil, but you know, that's, that's a way that we can use it for the better. Hmm. So, so generally fact checking sort of good evidence that can be effective, people will update their beliefs, as we say, some people are harder to reach, but we may have sort of uh, even more innovative or sort of scalable strategies like Premier Rick Tom to sort of reach uh, even sort of more uh, hardened people. Um, but this doesn't tend to necessarily change people's like deep beliefs or their political affiliations, but we can sort of, you know, hey, this, this isn't necessarily true. So, so kind of some optimism about fact checking. Um, I am curious about the double-edged sword thing, uh, uh, Tom. So uh, you can, you know, uh, I'm, I'm sure you've heard of this, right? So you can talk people out of conspiracy theories with, you know, mm -hmm. persuasive, deep conversations. Thus, you can talk people into yeah. conspiracies and well, other things. What's your take on this sort of offense-defense game here? We're, we're looking at it, um, I, 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 like, in with experiments that <laughs> require more ethical oversight than other kinds of experiments, maybe. And uh, the... So, so I'll have some more. I'll have a, like a, some concrete information on that soon. I, I would say I think I'm, I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic about it, both uh, in terms of how AI tools will impact the broader information ecosystem, um, and potentially even like an asymmetry in terms of being able to persuade individuals in terms of true or false things. So, so I'll start um, with the, with the asymmetry part. I think that uh, it's a much harder task, and it requires greater. Uh, reasoning capabilities um, to put together a narrative rooted in facts uh, that is both internally co consistent, coherent, um, and uh, like connect at all connective and like persuasive. So uh, in order to lie, tell a bunch of lies, all the lies need to uh, correspond to one another, like at least roughly, you know, people are doing this internal calculation in their head is like, does this make sense? Does that make sense? What about this other thing you said? And if so, the AI model is coming in with all of this wacky stuff that's totally made up. Um, it's really like a pretty hard co cognitive task to make everything align. Whereas true information has the advantage of all corresponding to the same thing, that is what actually happened. Um, and so the AI model does not have to uh, invent, the, like weave this yarn of things that is internally consistent, it just has to uh, copy what is already out there in the world. Um, and there are like alignment procedures that the frontier companies do to like help this along and not make sure that the AI uh, tool is not just mimicking like what wacky people on the internet are doing when they're spreading misinformation. So I think I think anyway, there's a case for for an asymmetry, uh, and I think it's much harder to be convincing and persuasive in a long format uh, when when you are, are are disconnected from the truth. In terms of the societal impacts, um, as we've said, misinformation is already out there. There's the uh, uh, you know the old chestnut uh, the 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 a lie goes around the world in the time it takes the truth to put its pants on or its shoes on. Um, and I think that there's this other notion of like a bullshit asymmetry, which is like that it's easier to spread misinformation than it is to combat it. And um, AI arguably is going to allow us to like do this really quick search across the space of factual information um, without much co human cognitive labor. And like, you can do a really quick debunk. You can say, okay, you're saying this thing, that's crazy. Uh, I'm, I'm going to like find exactly the fact that combats what you're saying without much work. And so, we're actually in uh, introducing AI into the information ecosystem, allowing uh, the like the truth to put its shoes on much faster, and 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 so maybe that's a good thing. 
this is very interesting. So kind of maybe an idealized version of this that pe people are working on is real time automated fact checking. So even if there's 10,000 false images posted a minute, in theory, AI could sort of scrape the facts out there and you know maybe respond very quickly. Uh, yeah. Really right. uh, but there's also a dark path, right? And I don't, you know, this is just one version of the future. I don't know if it's right. Yeah. I think Letitia just just posted one of these uh, possible sort of uh, flip yeah. sides in the chat also. So maybe let me sort of turn quickly to uh, other types of mitigations. So we're talking about um, you know uh, fact checking uh, type strategies that we you know maybe put on social media platforms, things like that, or that sort of news organizations or campaigns would be involved in. Um, I'm, I'm hoping you can speak to this, Valerie, which is the uh, idea of media literacy or digital literacy or AI literacy. So these are not, you know, just sort of relying on platforms to kind of, uh, you know, instantiate fact checking, but saying, can we sort of inoculate the public in different ways to be sensitive, especially with things like deep fakes that are pretty new to the public consciousness. Do you have thoughts on sort of the viability of media literacy or sort of where we stand, at least in the U.S.? Yeah, I mean, you know, I, oof, uh, I'm thinking about where we stand on just like the in, like internet literacy in general, and I'm not super optimistic about that. Um, so we add in another layer, um, which is, you know, don't trust anything you see anymore. Um, verify, look for the watermark, things like that. Um, and it gets kind of another layer on. But what I have seen in this context is a lot of people talk about like, you know, typical digital literacy strategies, getting um, people in the public school systems and things like that. But really, this is an everyone problem or an everyone challenge. And it it impacts the workforce, people who are working right now. It impacts, um, you know, people who are of retirement age. I mean, one of the uh, one of the most sort of pernicious challenges, well, there's two, which is, of course, like the non-consensual deepfake side, but also the scams. Those are the, the two places where we've seen a lot of these things um, sort of have their most problematic impacts at the personal level. Um, and, and, you know, I, I, teaching people how to recognize um, these sort of like to, to pause in their cognitive processing. And I'm not a psychologist, just a, just an armchair one. Um, but, uh, you know, teaching people to pause in their cognitive processes a little bit when they hear a voice that sounds like exactly their child um, is going to be even harder now. And so I think, um, you know, when we talk about digital literacy, we have to be thinking about the full spectrum of people, and especially those that might not be, um, you know, typically uh, reached by our traditional means that have been a little bit challenged uh, regardless. So, I mean, that that's generally, you know, I think it's really important, and I think we can't rely on companies to, um, you know, uh, add in these types of content provenance labels or those types of things, but actually have to teach people how to use them as well if, if companies are going to be to be adding this type of information. Um, but that cuts across the spectrum in terms of, of who needs to be to be taught these types of things too. So reasons to think that this is you know very difficult. It adds another layer of complicated sort of things people need to be literate about, which even have these sort of complicated trust issues. Don't trust anything and try to understand these complicated issues. But at the same time, you're saying this is still worth doing and maybe not just in primary and secondary education, but uh, Definitely uh, so not. elderly adults or vulnerable people, um, kind of a, a whole of society approach in addition to all the platform and other sort of regulatory strategies. Yeah, de I mean, definitely needs to cut across the, the cohort, every age cohort, for sure. I think of this often in terms of sort of multi-layered strategies that there's not just sort of like we have fact checking on social media and that fixes things or we sort of have to have multiple different types of strategies at the same time that are all kind of imperfect, but together they can help with things. I, I want to see if Letitia, you had any thoughts on kind of other mitigations you might have missed or your thoughts on literacy or platform governance, um, maybe even, you know, what researchers should be doing to manage their access or lack of access to these platforms to do further research. Yeah, I think I think I totally agree with the layered approach. Um, this is something my co-author and I have called the Swiss cheese approach to misinformation mitigation. So if you think back to like COVID times, which we've all blocked out, I think by now, uh, 
the the layers of the Swiss cheese model were like, we need masks and we need vaccines and we need social distancing and wash your hands and all the different things. And maybe the virus slips through one of those holes in the Swiss cheese is why it's called the Swiss cheese model. Uh, but, you know, hopefully eventually enough layers stacked up together will prevent it from uh, transmitting. Um, and I think misinformation is the same way, right? We have fact checking, we have inoculation, we have media literacy, we have things that the platforms can do, we have things that governments can do, we have things that individuals can do. Uh, there's a role of, for civil society, right? So I think uh, the more of those things we can put in place, the better chance we're gonna have. Um, it's worth noting that all of those things pretty much cost money and many of the organizations that we want to do the most work on this have the least money um, in terms of like journalists and civil society and things like that. Uh, some of the best work being done on media literacy is being done, you know, on a on a shoestring budget. Um, so that's worth thinking about is like, if this is something we really care about, we need to invest resources in it. Um, and I was gonna say something else and then I forgot because I get old and uh, that's how things go. We'll get back to you in a second, um, but that, that makes a lot of sense. Um the analogy of kind of the Swiss cheese approach. Um, so let me sort of turn to kind of a last question for each of you, and then we'll, we'll uh, go to the, the full audience here. Uh, so something that sometimes we struggle to do, or at least I struggle to do as an academic, is move from our, you know, surveys and experiments and ethnographies to, you know, what, what concrete practical and policy decisions can we make, in part because sometimes we're risk averse and we say, oh, we need more evidence. But I think we also feel kind of the urgency that there are, you know, maybe impacts happening in different ways uh, and there are certainly policy makers and practitioners that sort of seek input. Uh, so the, the ask for each of you uh, in the spirit of the academic lens for AI policy is, could you share sort of one concrete a policy recommendation, uh, you know, proposed legislation that you like or don't like, something you'd adjust, a solution that we think is really promising that uh, policymakers should sort of consider and adopt more? Uh, and maybe I can start with uh, you, Tom. Um. Well, I, I really appreciate the question. I would also say, like in the spirit of uh, epistemic humility and kind of uh, information literacy, I, I'm uh, I'm not a policy researcher. Like I, I don't have a special expertise there. Um, and I think you know they're probably like like it's a complex enough sy ecosystem system that uh, I don't know what the right solution is. Um, I'm I'm more interested in the human side, and I'm happy to talk about that. Uh, but uh, and if anything comes to me is like potentially an interesting way forward. Policy-wise, I'll let you know in the next. How about sort of on yeah. the practice or human sides that strike you as sort of compelling things to explore? Um. Okay. Fair. Yeah. I mean, I think that the uh, like, yeah, uh, education level programs, um, starting early on and in ways that are not like local to um, you know, like a particular class, like a like a health class, but for information literacy or, or critical thinking, but rather like building uh, how to think well. Um, and epistemic hygiene uh, into school curriculums, you know, doing it in math, doing it in, in English class, all, all sorts of things is is probably a great uh, idea and something that, that would really pay off in the long term. And uh, I would uh, I would absolutely encourage examination of those 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 sorts of policies that, that uh, weave uh, information literacy into the curriculum. OK, so epistemic hygiene, critical thinking part of this bucket of information media literacy skills that will be could be quite helpful for us yeah um, turn everyone into process. budding uh, cognitive psychologists i guess <laughs> yeah create a new generation uh okay wonderful so same question for you leticia um yeah so it's very hard to pick just one i think um i already alluded to funding before so i will i will uh sneakily suggest that 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 could be a, an alternative answer to this. But I'm actually going to go a different direction and say that the the best, uh, or I'm not going to say the best, but an option for policymakers is just requiring greater transparency um, from all of the purveyors of the information ecosystem. So all of all of the information bearing services, um, like social media platforms and search engines and all of the other ways that we get information in the modern media environment. Um, and that means making data available not just to researchers like the the people on this call but also to the public so that they can make reasonable decisions about how they navigate those spaces um and uh i will put in a plug here that kgi is uh starting to work on this issue um the 
institute that I work with, Knight Georgetown Institute, which is focused on connecting independent research with technology policy and design, is particularly focused on this issue of public data access to these information bearing services um, so that we can make healthier and more informed decisions about how we consume content. Okay, so uh, funding to actually build the capacity and infrastructure to do these things we care about, and then uh, increased transparency. Um, I don't know if it's along the lines of Digital Services Act or something else, but for researchers and for the public so they can sort of navigate these, these tools and these environments. Um, uh, wonderful. Okay, Valerie, uh, kind of last official word is, is for you. What are, what are your thoughts here? Yeah, so I would foot stomp um, like all over all over Washington um, transparency. I think that that is a hugely important thing that, you know, part of the challenge in this space that sort of stems from the social challenges to the legislative challenges are just that uh, people don't trust what these platforms are doing and the content moderation decisions that are being made. Um, and that leads to an overall perception that, you know, big tech is out to get us and their censorship and this and that. And so I think where transparency into content moderation decisions can be um, made, where um, data access is available for the public, um, more purview into some of these algorithmic systems as well, I think would be hugely valuable in kind of rebuilding some of that trust. I'll add another sort of bigger issue that stems across, I think, all of these tech issues, which is data privacy, um, just giving people a little bit more control over their data. Um, there was a little bit of hope. I mean, this has been a conversation for a long, long time in the U.S. context. There was a tiny sliver of hope this spring that sort of has disappeared again. Um, but, you know, it, it's on the table as far as tech legislation um, goes, which has generally been quite difficult. Um, the, you know, tech legislation has been um, sort of uh, elusive, except for the TikTok ban um, for maybe two decades or so. Um, and then, you know, to get like really concrete to throw out like an actual bill at you. Uh, so easy, so low hanging fruit. And I think it passed by voice vote in the Senate with like overwhelming support is the Defiance Act, um, which is working to combat non-consensual explicit deep fakes, um, kind of became uh, an idea as a result of Taylor Swift, of course. Um, and I think that there are, you know, parallels, especially to um, child sexual abuse materials and the way that the US Congress has legislated around that, that make it an actual tractable issue that could pass First Amendment scrutiny. Um, and so I'm hopeful that that will be something because I do think that that is a really, um, a really problematic area in this space that can be fairly um, easily addressed and does have like real bipartisan interest. Okay, defines act non-consensual intimate imagery, very concrete thing that can get support, uh, data privacy, transparency uh, as well. Um, well. A wonderful list of suggestions with this. Let's turn it to the audience for the next 10, 12 minutes. Uh, please throw your questions in the chat or Q and A. Um, questions, thoughts? Cheeks. Um, and while you post your questions, I think we have one from, from Lee. Um, so Lee says, taking up Tom's mention of real-world impact, he'd be interested to hear panelists talk about two kinds of impacts of misinformation, disinformation. Um, so one is the first order impacts on people's voting intentions and opinions, and the second is second order impacts on people's level of social trust, institutional trust, sense of democracy. I think this is connected to some of the earlier conversations about these indirect effects, Valerie. But uh, whoever, whoever wants to, yeah. This one. Uh, well, I I have one thought of it too, which is I mean, yeah, the uh, accounting like thinking about both levels is is super useful. Um, if the AI tools continue to develop, as it seems like they're going to, there's a third level th order thing, um, which is uh, we can't really trust anything we see or or hear in the same way we once could, or at least for like you know. It's, 70 year window between the invention of photography or video photography and uh, AI really taking off. And um, that's going to, that's not so much like an incremental change. I think that's going to be more of like a phase shift in terms of how we interact with the world and think about what's true and false. And uh, there's going to be other changes that co occur with that. Um, it makes it really difficult to predict. But if we're looking at policy solutions, um, that that mitigate like the the harms or damages uh, of uh, like pretty smart AI, really smart AI. 
I think like fairly drastic solutions are in order rather than um, incremental ones and like stuff could get pretty weird and scary in the future, just like as a thought. Potentially sort of some, some dramatic I'll ways. This most, I'll add also most of the academic research that I've seen and that I've been involved in, um, you know, a lot of it's not necessarily about persuasion um, or sh changing people's minds um, at the sort of center. It's kind of like people go to the polls where they already believe and double down on their on their opinions. Um, one of the things that I've looked at as well is, um, and I'm working on this paper with a bunch of colleagues, is around mobilization and sort of the mobilizing effects. Um, this idea that you know, because we've seen we've seen the impacts in some sense of you know what talking about the election was stolen, um, what that does in terms of a real world phenomenon that we saw that in January 6th. And so, you know, while it may not be persuasive, there certainly could be, you know, even just small percentages of people who become mobilized by this type of information. And those people could live in those polls, right? And so I think that that is certainly um, something that is, is worth exploring further. But then on the AI side, I think these sort of second order impacts, the ones that I talked about a little bit more, these ideas of just like overall trust in the information space, um, trusting what we see, the idea that seeing is believing, um, sort of no longer valid and what does that mean for just broader democracy in terms of you know a fundamental pillar is the informed public and and I think that that is that is really challenging and if anybody has a solution there I would be very open to it. So it almost sounds like AI could be more impactful on these second order effects but some of our sort of traditional misinformation still is impactful on that kind of first order level at least for you know margins of people that could still make a difference. OK, so I think I missed your question, Nicholas. Um, so Nicholas mentions there have been efforts to integrate cryptographic proofs of authenticity into media through efforts like Adobe's Content Authenticity Initiative, apps like the Nodal Click app, um, so provenance, deep fake detection. Uh, so if tomorrow X, Facebook, Instagram adopted support for these proofs or the, the C2PA standard, the Content Provenance Authenticity standard, uh, how dramatically would the digital deception landscape change? I'm not optimistic because people wouldn't know what to look for. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think part of that is on the education side as well. So it's, you know, they can introduce all these different types of standards, but if people don't actually know where to go for that information, then. Yeah, so that... I think, I mean, it's, I think it's really hard. So, so like there's like the technological component, maybe it's doable. You can uh, brand the AI generated content, uh, but then there's, there are like all of these judgments that would need to be made. Um, so, so one example, right, is someone uses AI to like edit their something they themselves wrote, and maybe it's like a journalist to just kind of like smooth out some of the transitions or correct some grammar. And it's a true news story um, that they're reporting on, and it gets flagged as AI generated. Um, so, so now people are not going to trust the the true piece of information, even though the 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 uh, earmarking was correct, like the technological component was correct. Um, and so there's this this issue of like discernment. Um, that you know, X or Twitter or whatever has has sort of helped like move move along with with crowdsourcing uh, judgments. Um, like this is the the bird watch or commu and community notes as it's as, as it's now called, and um, that seems very promising to me. Um, and maybe like AI could could be um, some extension of like a crowd like a crowdsourcing model could be good here. Um, but but yeah, it's, and then there's there's this arms race dynamic that that uh, you know AI generated content. It's the same thing with uh, information security now. Like, like hackers come up with new tools, and and uh, the IT people come up with with new uh, defenses, and and uh, who knows how that how that will unfold. But but I think I think even with with uh, earmarking, it uh, the problem won't won't be solved. Okay, so some, some uh, at least you know concern that sort of uh, provenance and detection techniques are certainly not foolproof. One will not solve things. At minimum, there needs to be more information literacy. And there's still this offense defense challenge. Um, let me let me turn to a question for you, uh, um, Leticia. I, I think so. Troy asks, um, uh, what would public data access look like? And he's worried that personal data is already too widespread; it's too accessible. Um, would this be? Would your initiative be sort of increasing this public access to data, or what is what is your model of sort of the public engaging with information? Yeah, so that's such a great question, um, and it's a really important point, right? So we we simultaneously need more data and less data, um, 
people like uh, Valerie was talking about, we need data, data privacy, right? There should be less data that is just available about people in general. The kinds of data we're talking about are kind of aggregate level data. So it wouldn't be people's personal information being shared. Um, it's also worth highlighting that uh, we operate through an expert working group. So we have about a dozen different people from different walks of life, journalists, policymakers, academics, civil society researchers um, from all different kinds of backgrounds that are coming together to have these kinds of conversations about like, what are the privacy trade-offs and how do we do this in a privacy protecting way? Um, and in what, in what form should the data be made available? Um, but right now, counting on, you know, platforms and, and others to disclose of their own volition, it means number one, we just get way less information than we need to be able to make these sorts of decisions. And number two, they can provide that information in whatever form they please, which means that it's basically useless from a comparison perspective, right? You can't look at one platform and compare it to another platform because the data is in such different form that it's not comparable. Um, so that's that's kind of what we're trying to achieve with this new initiative. So right now we don't. Oh, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, there's a question in the chat instead of the Q and A by my colleague Elizabeth, who's thanking you for the Harper's Magazine, uh, you know, uh, essay, and but asking if there are other similar readings for students. So I wanted to just bring that to your attention. But I also uh, have my own question, if you don't mind, uh, uh, because uh, everything that we heard on the panel today points that the uh, the burden of responsibility is still on human beings, not on AI, because in the mainstream media, we tend to hear that AI does this, that, and the other, uh, you know, as, as if it is AI, you know, doing these things. Uh, but if I understand all of you correctly, it is still human players who, who do these things, you know, with some help from AI. If that understanding is accurate, where should the burden of accountability be, uh, you know, in the current environment, and especially with law and policy in mind? Yeah, um, I, I guess my my worry there is, is it's a, you know, a cooperation game like a prisoner's dilemma, and and if you build the you know this nice, well-behaved AI model, uh, and another actor decides that they don't want to do that, they want to build a, a mean AI model, then you lose, and uh, I I don't really know how to get around that, yeah. But humans have done it. It's not it, like like this is like this is you know, I, I don't think there's no hope. It's just it's a problem. It strikes me that there's some interesting things to think about here in terms of if there is this sort of offense defense contest, what are ways to advance things that might be sort of in, more immune from one direction than the other? And you point out to sort of spillover effects. You release a good model and someone releases a bad model. So actors need to be thinking about how their behaviors can sort of. Uh, yeah, so so one thing that, that strikes me as really nice is um like modeling like like a world that acts some some uh, something like the the U.S. Uh, uh, legal system, um where where we have a adversarial adversarial um uh in, interface solution for for discovering truth or something that like uh, usually gets at the truth, which is like you know you have a defense attorney, the prosecutor, and they argue and the jury decides. Um, and the idea is that like, given two equally talented attorneys. Um, the truth will give the 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 one of the attorneys the edge, and that's how we find the truth. You know, it's like we both go at it, and then the, whoever has the better story is usually the one that that has the truth on their side. There's obviously like failure modes there, and that's not always the case, but it seems to do better than other other things. And and so if you have fairly smart persuasive AIs and you allow them to debate with one another, maybe you converge on the truth, and we can kind of like open the public square to these like debating AI models as a as a as a new. Uh, a new uh, source of information for the public. To the, Valerie, you want to take the last word here and then I'll close this out? Yeah, to the question about other examples, one of them that I think about, another one that I reference, and I, I just pulled it up because it's a great, a great quote. Um, after the downing of the Maine in the Havana Harbor in Cuba in 1898, um, the quote, it's a historian writes um, at the time, um, it was to such a state of mind that the war with Spain came, and the result has the special interest of showing the almost instantaneous readiness with which a seed of thought germinates when it falls upon mental soil prepared already to receive it. And so, you know, like this was basically like 
almost a made up story and people just were kind of itching for war and they needed the ex the excuse and and that was the the explosion of the USS Maine so um you know i i think about that example as another one too yeah it's uh, a wonderful example maybe you maybe something we can do to your question elizabeth is gather some of the resources we've shared in the chat uh, gather some of y'all's recent initiatives and papers. I think Lee shared a, a, a night report that summarizes some of the state of the art, you know, findings in the misinformation space. We can maybe, uh, Hamid, Linnell, we can sort of blast it out to attendees of the panel to be able to share these resources. Um, but I wanted to just say, uh, please give a round of applause uh, or, or Zoom or Teams claps uh, as, as you will for our amazing panelists who sort of took on this effort to share some of these insights. Um, we hope that you've you know found this valuable and that you can be able to sort of bring some of these ideas forward in a positive voice. Thank you very much, Daniel and everybody. Uh, a fantastic conversation. We hope to do more of this in the future with you and other colleagues uh, with support and in feedback from all the audience and uh, others. Thank you. If you value this, please join the triple AIP. Yes, please. Yeah, thank you for that as well. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much, everyone. You all take care. Thank you.